Well, if you got your Bible, I'm going to pr- try to preach this as, as best as God will anoint me and uh, enable me to do. I've got some stuff to say, and I want to just jump into this. It's Psalm chapter 119. Psalm chapter 119. I'm going to use one verse as my text. After I do that, we're going to pray. After we pray, I'm going to take you um, way over into the New Testament. We'll do that in just a second, but let's begin right here. You're probably opening your Bible somewhere in the middle of it. This is the shortest chapter in the Bible, right? Quite, quite the opposite, the longest chapter in the Bible. And uh, verse, go down to verse 89, 89, Psalm 119, 89. It says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. We'll stop right there and let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the power. We thank you for the anointing. I ask that the anointing pour over me like oil being poured over top of something. Let oil, let anointing come over me. Anoint me to preach, to speak, God, because in myself I'm, I'm simple and, and I'm needy and I need you today. We all need you today. We need you, God. We look to you, God. So come down, come near, come here. Father, move in this place. Let the Holy Spirit come like a wind. Come now. Lord, the wind is open. The doors are open. Our hearts are open their minds are open there's openness here there's willingness here God there's a readiness here there's a hungry heart here there's a thirsty soul here we we want you we need you God we just want to pray for another second and and just express to you that we just need you to come by God you can be all over the place and you are all over the place but I pray as you are all over the place you are here today I pray God that you don't have to knock on the door of this church just come on in the door is open to you We, we welcome you we want you to move today God and we give you praise and glory for it God in the mighty name of Jesus amen and amen praise God Psalm, Psalm 119 89 your word is it's settled in heaven your word is settled in heaven before I get into into that completely I want to bring out to you in Revelation chapter 12 in Revelation chapter 12 It's just kept coming to me there as I just prayed and worshipped on the front row. This, this just kept coming to me. It wasn't in my notes, but it just kept coming to me so strong. So I want to go to Revelation 12, and I, I knew where this was at, so I didn't have to look it up. I just flipped over in the pages, and it's, it's down at verse 11. But I, I, I thought, I want to just read that whole chapter real quick, and I did. And, and there's stuff, there just feels like something is, is hot on that chapter right now and I'm not going to preach it and get into to too much of it but um, you, you might when you get a spare moment just look at verse 15 and see if something don't just make you go hmm <laughs> you know that's all I'm going to say about that but it just kind of makes me go hmm and then but verse 11 is what I really want to share with you today um, I, I, I have a feeling I may talk more about verse 15 but not today verse 11 and they overcame him they being, we'll just say the saints, we'll say you. Let's just make it personal. You. You overcome him, the him there is the devil. You overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb. That's what Jesus did, right? You overcome him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb, what Jesus did, and the word of your testimony. Make it personal. Your testimony, your word. You overcame the, the devil by the blood of the lamb, what Jesus did, and the word of your testimony. That's what you do. You take what Christ has done and you, you make it specific by speaking it forth. Okay? So now going back to Psalm 119, verse 89. And I've got a few notes here that I'm going to use. And I'm going to try, stay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to stay close to this pulpit. And I'm going to look at my notes. Because what that's going to do is going to keep me from rambling and getting off on all kinds of different things, which I could. And I'm going to try to be good. And I just try to be focused. And we're going to try to be here for not forever today. Okay? I want to just, boom, get this out, drop it, you know. I had a pastor one time that he said, Preach that, boy. Preach that, boy. Preach it like I Chicken laying an egg in the middle of the road. Get out there and drop it and get off the road, you know. Whatever that means, you know. Isn't that a visual? Oh, here we go, like a chicken dropping an egg in the middle of the road. <laughs> Y'all pray. <laughs> oh, okay. So Psalm 118, 
or 119, verse 89. The word. I feel like God has given me what is a word for 2013. And I'm trying my best to, to get a good handle on it. So that, see, you can, ha you can have something on the inside of you that you hear from God, that you get in your mind, your heart, and your soul, and you can get it. And there are different levels of getting it. One of the first levels is you get it, you feel it. Just like when I shared with you the dream about 44 that I had. That dream, when I had the dream, I wake up and I feel God. Oh, Lord, wow, God gave me a dream. Woo. But then the second, you know, thing that comes to me is, Okay, I had something from God. But what is it? What does it mean? Okay, so then I began to seek it out, and I had it. I mean, it was all over me. I could feel it. I knew it was from God, but I didn't yet have it. Even when I began to get the pieces of it, I still didn't have it to the point and level that I could communicate it to somebody else. Somebody asked me directions to something the other day. I could get there. But I didn't know the roads. I didn't know the names of the roads or the numbers of the roads. So for me to give directions to somebody else, even though I knew how to get there myself, I didn't know well enough to help somebody else get there. So I'm, I'm feeling this right here. God has put this thing on me, and I got it. It's on me, and it's in me, and it's stirring and jumping and, 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 and on the inside of me. And I just pray today that what is on me and in me and uh, you know what I feel, what I feel like I've got, I feel like and pray for the ability to communicate, to give you directions to get where I'm trying to get to. Are you all with me? So here is what I feel like the Lord is saying to me. I feel like this verse is going to be a text, and I feel like it's prophetic for the year 2013. And what, what that means is the word is settled, and it's settled in heaven. And I want to break this down, the word. First of all, let's take a look at the word and talk about this for a second. Psalm 119 was a love affair with the word, the whole chapter. It never really changes subject. Verse by verse by verse by verse by verse by verse, over and over and over, he's talking about his affection toward the Word. Now, in your Bible, in your translation, it's a good chance you read it and you see it as law. He says, you know, I meditate on your law or your precepts. But what we must do is translate that to Word because the law is all of the Word that he had at that time. He didn't have a leather-covered, you know, book that said Holy Bible on it. Right? Y'all understand that, right? This is the Old Testament. So what they had of Scripture to that point was pretty much what you would call the law. And they called the law. And so he was having a love affair with the Word. The Word, the law was the Word that God had gave them. And it was dear to him. It was precious to him. He would stay up late reading it. He would wake up early just to dive into the Word. He would make it part of Himself. He said in this same chapter, Your Word have I hid in my heart. He said, Your Word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. He was saying, It is my direction. It tells me where to go. It tells me how to get there. It tells me who to be. The Word. So this affection that he has with the Word is something that we too should adopt. Now, the Jewish people to this day have an appreciation, a reverence, and honor to the Word, not necessarily the full Word, the full Gospel like we do, but what they have and what they respect and understand to be the Word of God, they have such an honor and devotion to that far surpasses what you and I do. See, I was raised in church, so even from a young child, I was taught things from the, from the old, time, old timers. I was taught things and I got a lot of it by osmosis and I would overhear people say it and maybe even somebody instructed me to do things like, you know, and some people I would hear, they wouldn't even lay their Bible on the floor. They felt it was such a thing of respect and honor. This is the Holy Word of God. I'm not even going to lay it on the floor. I to this day have, and I, and I don't do that, I don't feel like there's any problem because I'll set my Bible under my seat because I don't want it to get stomped on and I'll just kind of organize my things neatly under a seat like right there is my iPhone and my, my car keys. And I'm going to be watching them, so anyway. <laughs> so I don't necessarily have a problem with 
putting my Bible on the floor because I'll do it neatly and, and I'll, I'll do it respectfully to kind of have it out of the way. And so, you know, sister over there, don't stomp on it when she gets excited and stuff. But I, I, I tell you what I will do. I won't put things on top of my Bible. And I'm, I'm weird, almost OCD about it. I don't let other people... People will come and they'll sit a book or a, a, anything, something, keys, anything on my Bible. And I'll be looking at it. And it's like, oh. and as soon as they turn their head, I take it off. My, I, I don't like anything on top of my Bible. I won't put other books on my Bible. I'm not talking about law this morning because it doesn't matter. You might do that. and it does. It's just a weird. But it, for me, it comes out of respect and appreciation and honor. If you, if you do that, it doesn't mean you appreciate the word of God less than I do. But now the Jewish people, they had such a respect, a respect and honor and devotion and dedication to the truth and the value of the Word of God. I was in Israel a few years ago, and as I approached the Western Wall, uh, along with so many of the, the Jewish people and, and some of these you know, devout people, they would take what they would have as pieces of the Word of God, and they would hold it as they, as they gradually approached the wall like we would gradually approach the presence of God. And that is very neat right there how and what they would do because they wouldn't just rush toward God. They would take a step or two at a time and then they would just pray over themselves. And they would, they would pray to appreciate what they were doing and as they were ap approaching a, a holy God to pray and communicate. And, they would, and as they would go, I would notice they would, they would take what pieces of Scripture they, they would have and they would bring it to their mouths and kiss it. And they would hold it close to their heart and over top of their heart. And they would just rock with it. And then they would get to the wall and they would pray. And they'd kiss the word and they'd speak the word. And they'd pray the word and they'd rock. As, as young children in the Bible, the, the, the Jewish boys especially were indoctrinated with the words of God. And they would, they would memorize the word. God gave it to the Jewish people because... For one thing, they were very devout and they were very disciplined in their handling of the Word of God. And they would pass down stories. To That's why the Bible says in Psalms, one generation shall praise your works to another generation. They would very carefully, very carefully tell the stories of God and not miss a detail. And so their, their appreciation, if they were, if, as they were recording the Word of God, if one thing was messed up, they wouldn't go grab white out, even if they had it. They would scrap the whole work of the day and start over. Very disciplined and dedicated and honor and respect toward the holy word of God. So uh, the psalmist here in this long chapter is declaring his appreciation and his affection toward the word of God. And maybe it set you off in the beginning when I said a love affair with the Word of God. But I believe that's exactly what it was and what it is because this was God to him. You have to understand, this was the closest he could get to God. To help us understand that, if you are distanced from a loved one, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife, a family member that's dear to you, if you have distance from them for some reason, now days gone by, it was different. Now, I guess today it would be a text or an email or some social media communication. And you, you get that. And even though you're far away maybe in a different state or different country or what have you, you would get that from them and that's them to you. You ever seen the movie Notebook? You don't have to admit it. But you know, the, even the voice and the mental image that comes from just the story and the writings. Days gone by, I said it's not... At, that, at, at, at times not too far back in distance, it wasn't a text or social media. It was a handwritten letter. And so your, your loved one, your hot and heavy, would, would, would write you, you know, that they miss you and they love you and they're thinking about you. And then you get that letter from their hand and that's the closest thing that you have to them. It's, it's dear to you. It's precious to you. You're excited to get that. I can remember in high school. You know, little sweetheart, you know, and passing a letter from her, you know, her to me or me to her in the hallway, you know, passing each other. She's going to her class. Come on now, it wasn't that long ago for y'all, was it? I'm already just for men, you know. Y'all know what I'm talking about. 
and you get this little giddy feeling, you know, this little smile comes on you and stuff, and you want, because, and then you go to that next class, and you open it up, and it's just like, she's talking to you, you know, or he's talking to you. That's what the Word of God was for, for the psalmist here. It was a love affair. It was the closest thing that he had to God. And, and so he was, he was very, very much appreciative of this. He said, I hide it in my heart. It's my direction. I, I wake up early just to get in it. And I stay up sometimes late just to meditate on your word. And I, and I keep it and it's dear to me and it's precious to me. But guys, we have to be something similar to that. I don't know if we'll get fully to that place, but we must have a great appreciation for the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He sent His Word, and He healed their diseases. The Word works. Before Oral Roberts, in his tent revival days, before he would pray for people, before he would believe with people on a personal, physical contact level to be healed and receive a miracle, he never did that. His practice was he always would teach or preach first. And he believed that the Word had to go forth because he said from that Scripture, he sent his Word and healed our diseases. And he felt like the Word would go forth and begin to do combat in the room, in the atmosphere, over moods and attitudes. And it would drive out doubt and unbelief. Just the release of the Word can affect the climate. And, and can, can clear the air. And he, he felt like the Word was like a seed of faith being dropped into the hearts and minds of the people. So that after the Word went forth, then they were ready for their miracle and their healing because the Word had already started working it in them. And so he believed that. I believe that because it's the Word of God. I don't have to have Oral Roberts to tell me that. I see it. Yes, amen to that. I see it. The Word works. The Word is called a hammer. The Word is called a fire. The Word is called a sword. The sword of the Spirit, Hebrews 4. The sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6. The, the Word is something that we should reverence. And, and so when we talk about the Word, there are a couple of things that I want to branch off here and release and speak to you. Positive and negative. The, 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 the positive part is this. A few years ago, the Lord spoke to me and He said, Things of the kingdom are voice activated. I'll never forget it. It was powerful when God gave it to me. I was in revival in Hodgenville, Kentucky. Hodgenville, Kentucky. Hodgenville, Kentucky is where Abraham Lincoln was born. And I was in revival in, in Hodgenville, Kentucky. And while I was in revival there, the Lord spoke to me one night, uh, sitting on the, on the front row. He said, the things of the kingdom are voice activated. And I, I began to realize, boom, 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 boom. My head began to connect to scriptures and I realized this is so true. When the storm came with strong winds and waves, it was going to take them out as they were on a boat in the sea and it was going to take them out and take them under and probably destroy them. When they got Jesus up and Jesus came out, what did He do to change things? He spoke to the wind and waves. He said to you and I that if we had to have faith like as of a grain of mustard seed that we could speak to a mountain and it would be... So God... He, he really commanded or taught us, Jesus taught us to speak to our obstacles. And he, he said, speak to a mountain, speak to your obstacle, and then it will be moved. The problem is, we don't get to the place sometimes of speaking, of releasing stuff. We're more introverted, and we hold it in. Why in the world do we hold it in? I don't know. It's this religious thing that gets on us that we think coming to churches is proper and pretty. You, the Bible says that you would release from out of your belly would come rivers of living water. Well, these rivers of living water, how are they going to flow up out of your body? Are they going to come out of your ears? Are they going to leak out your eyes? Are they, what are, what, the rivers of living water are going to come out of you through your spoken word, through your song, through the release from your mouth, you'll speak. Now the problem is the river sometimes gets dammed up like a reservoir, not allowing the flow to come forth. And you know what? And I'm not cussing. Please understand in context what I'm saying. But you know what the dam problem is? Go ahead and giggle. It's okay. But you know what the thing is that, that's damming up the flow of the river of God coming? Listen, because it's supposed to come from believers. Jesus is not on the earth in physical flesh and blood anymore. He's operating through you and I. And He's still wanting to do miracles, but He's going to do it through you and I. 
And the problem is we hold back and we're reserved and we're just a little bit skittish. But God doesn't want us to be. He wants us to break those dams. And the way we break those dams is, is quit being so in, infatuated with being quiet. Raise your voice. Speak up. Begin to praise God. Say your hallelujah. Say amen. Listen, when you say amen to a preacher, it just does something to him. And I don't understand, but it feeds the anointing and the fire that's on the inside of the preacher or the singer when you sing along. But when they're singing and you're standing there, they're just waiting to get to that last song. Or maybe in the next song it'll break open. But when we release the flow, and it's that simple, it's that practical. When we open our mouth, the things of the kingdom are voice activated. The word of faith is nigh thee. It, where's it at? In your mouth, the Bible says. And so if we begin to understand, look, Jesus went to a tree, cursed the tree, and it withered and died. And he said, you think that's something, you're going to do greater things. And how? He told us to speak. He told us to preach. Listen, the apostles, you know what they asked when they gave prayer requests to the church as they were going from place to place? They said, pray for us that we would have boldness to fully declare and preach and speak forth the things of the kingdom. Why was that a prayer request? Because it's an intimidation in the spirit to not be bold and declare. Not everybody wants to hear it. And you get in climates and places where it's harder to be free and open. But God wants us to understand the power of the Word. And He wants us to understand there's power when we speak the Word. When we pray the Word. When we worship with the Word. When we release what's on the inside of us. The victory that's on the inside of us. You know what your victory is? You know what your sermon is? You may not be called to the pulpit, but you've got a testimony. You've got a story. He brought me out of the miry clay. He brought my feet up on a rock to stay. That's my story. We used to sing that loud and proud. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my sake. You know, that used to be something we'd get excited about. Having a story. Having a testimony. Knowing who we used to be. Listen, I'm not who I'm, I'm supposed to be, but I'm not who I used to be. God's bringing me from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from strength to strength. He's taking us somewhere. And the power of that is released in testimony. When you speak it forth. And in, in, in Revelation 12, 11, it says we beat the devil up by speaking forth our story. The Word of God as it has become personal to us. You have the Word of God as a story on the inside of you. And when you listen, the Word of God is wonderful, but if we're not careful, it will become black ink on white pages, or in some cases, red ink on white pages, and not much more. But when we believe it and are able to articulate it and speak it forth, it's something more powerful then. Sometimes you need to talk to the devil. Sometimes you need to talk to yourself. The psalmist, he spoke to himself. He encouraged himself in the Lord. What about you? Maybe you're not going to get up out of your depression. Maybe you're not going to get up out of your poverty. Maybe you're not going to get up out of that low place that you've been stuck in until you start talking to yourself and telling yourself, don't stay down. You weren't meant to be down. You weren't meant to stay down. And begin to talk to yourself and begin to declare that the devil might be Dr. Down. He'll get you down, look you down, stare you down, knock you down, hit you down, kick you down. Anything he can do to get you down, Dr. Down. But Jesus, hallelujah, is more than so up. He's more. He Listen, he can get you up for every time the devil gets you down. And it doesn't matter how down you get, you ain't dead yet. And if, it, if you are dead, you know what? You still ain't ultimately down because the spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it dwells in you. He can't get you down enough that God can't get you up. As so you come in agreement with the word of God and you begin to speak it, Sometimes you speak it and you don't even know if you believe it or not. You just keep speaking it. You keep saying it until you believe it. I'm telling you, you keep speaking the Word of God. It's alive. It's not just a book. There's a reason that it's always the bestseller. But there's a reason too. Listen, it doesn't matter how many copies it sells. And it doesn't matter how many people burn it and how many people love it. it. It just matters that it's real and it's legit. And it's the Word of God. The living Word of God. 
That means it's not just words. Sometimes I'll leave, we'll leave in our house, sometimes we'll just leave Bibles open in rooms. Because we believe it's alive. We don't think it's a, a, a typical other book. We think it's alive. We feel like it can affect the culture and the climate and the atmosphere of our home. So if there's stress and fighting and, and, and fussing, we'll just open the Bible and leave it in, that, in the rooms, you know? We believe that the Word works. Work the Word. The Word works. That's the Word for 2013 right there. Work the Word. The Word works. But I've got to get some more stuff out to you. That's the positive stuff. Speak the Word. The power of God will come when you speak the Word. The negative or the, the sad part is this. The sad part is sometimes the power of the word or words in general, they will work against us. Let's talk for a second about word curses. Word curses can come from us, not just from witches and warlocks and people in the occult, but word curses can come to, to us even from people that love us and even people that like us, people that... Maybe you're in the same church circle as us or people that are related to us. Because the Bible teaches us that what we speak from our mouths, our words, there is power. The power is twofold. It can bless and it can curse. And that's not talking to witches and it's not talking to people in the occult. It's talking to everybody. Everyone should understand there are power in your words. And your words can bless people or it can do the reverse. Your words can bring life, or your words can be downers. And we all know people like that. Hopefully we don't know the person in the mirror as being that person. But we need to understand the power of our... Is this okay? Y'all understand what I'm saying right now? So let me give you an example of what I'm saying, because I say even good people can speak word curses. Yeah, and uh, oftentimes we do it unintentionally. We really like the person. Several years ago, I was on staff at a church. I was a youth pastor, but God was opening doors left and right for me to go and preach and do revivals, and I was getting requests to come preach at places, and the pastor's wife noted it. We loved them. They loved us. We had a great relationship with the church and the pastors, and she came to me one night and said, listen, I sense that God may be calling you for at least a season to do full-time evangelism. She said, I'm not trying to push you away. I, I hate to even thought of, of you not being here all the time. She said, but I think you need to pray about this. We did pray about it, and we had a talk with the pastors, and they gave us our blessing. They seen God doing it, and they released us, and we went to do it. But now the pastor said something, and this is what he said to us. He was kind of chuckling, so he wasn't completely serious, but still he said it. He said, now you know, come December, I guess it was close to the end of the year, he said, come December, y'all will starve to death. He said, do an evangelism. As an evangelist, you're going to starve to death every December. He said, because churches don't have revivals in December. There's too much going on in churches. There's, you know, Christmas programs and plays and cantatas and people are out shopping. And he said, so you're not going to get many bookings and you're not going to have income. You're not going to have any, any support in December. So you just need to be prepared that you're just going to starve to death through December every year. And we laughed and ha ha. Oh. And you know what? We kind of forgot about it, but we went three years in a row starving to death in December, having to apologize to people for not getting a gift this year. You know, because we were we barely would survive through December. And then one year, you know, around the first of the year, the Lord spoke to my wife, and it's like, boom. The face of our former pastor just came uh, to, to, like a mental image to her, and she could hear him saying, you will starve to death in December. You won't hardly make it in December. You won't have money in December. And the Lord brought that back to her mind, and she realized, and she said to me, she came to me, she said, honey, I feel like the Lord just brought that back to me. She said, do you think that could be like an unintentional curse? I felt a Holy Ghost all over that. I said, he didn't mean that for evil, but he spoke that out over our lives of what we would experience. Let's break that curse. Let's come against it and not receive it and shake it off of it. And we did in agreement and said, no, we take that curse and we throw it off of us and we don't receive it. And, and God, that thing that is attached to us, let it be detached. And, gee, and we just really come in agreement 
coming against that thing. And you know what? After that, we were blessed. Every December after that, God blessed us and we've seen increase. And it was just, it was a freaky kind of thing how God would begin to bless us in December. But we believed for it. We had our faith attached. It's getting close to December. And you know what? We would have depression as we get into October and November. We would already start feeling depressed because we knew how bad it was going to be. But now when it gets close to the end of the year, it's the most wonderful time. Because God broke that thing. God broke that thing. But you see how when we speak words, they can be curses. And they can speak death. And especially when it comes to somebody sick or, you know, in the hospital or something. Don't go in and saying stuff just because it sounds good. You can say stuff and it sounds good and just be wrong. Well, maybe it's God's will for you just to suffer through. That's just stupid. That's not God's will. You think that's His will? If that was His will, why was Jesus' back totally sliced open with the beating that He took? We know what His will was. He took that beating on His back with His cat of nine tails so that the metal and the stuff that was laced into the end of this whip would hit His back and it wouldn't just be a spanking but the, the glass and the metal and the, and the elements tied to the end of the whip would latch on to pieces of flesh and rip off over and over and over and He was doing it and He never stopped and He never snapped His fingers and He never whistled for angels to come get Him out of it because every, every stripe was pain for your sickness and your pain and your suffering. It was on Him. It's His will to heal you. He can fix you. And so we got to be careful that we don't speak stupid things that are really contrary with the Word of God. Speak life. Come in agreement. If somebody's believing, if somebody's optimistic, if somebody's hopeful, don't be somebody that walks around dashing hope. If you, if you can't believe it, just keep listening. Did your mama ever teach you, if you ain't got anything good to say, don't say nothing at all. We need more people in the church shutting up. Now, I know a minute ago I said we've been too quiet, but listen, if you ain't got some praise coming up out of you, if you ain't got the river of life coming up out of you, if you ain't got no joy coming out of you, if you ain't releasing and imparting peace to those that are around you, shut up until you get some. And I say that with all the love of God that I can muster. <laughs> but seriously, some people have that as an anointing upon their life. And they like to sing. When people like that, they like to sing specials. And if you don't let them sing specials, they'll want to give prayer requests that aren't really prayer requests. If you let them sing a special, it's going to be something that you're going to just want to cry and slit your wrist and all this stuff after you hear it. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God ain't into that. God ain't putting gloom and despair and agony on. Listen, I, I, listen, I love the, some of the McCamey stuff and I love some of them songs, but I think people get way too excited about God of the night and God of the valley. We get more excited about the God in the valley and God in the night than we do about the God in the day and God in the mountaintop because we spend more time there. We identify with it. We relate to it. I'll sing that again. The God of the good time. He's still God in the bad time. Woo! Glory. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I've, I've sang that song and, and listened to that song in my car. But anyway, I've sang that song and listened to that song and enjoyed it, you know. But at the same time, I, I think some people had a weird, weird fixation with it. And they, they just really like the bad times. They really like the valleys. And if you listen to them and talk to them, they're going to tell you what they're going through. And it's all they have to talk about is the stuff they're going through. So be careful what you release. Be careful what you speak. Speak life. Speak blessing. And if somebody, pay attention. Allow the Holy Spirit to bring to your mind, bring to your attention. If people, and this is what the Lord's going to do in 2013 for you. He is going to reveal and illuminate word curses that have been spoken over you because some of us, if not many or all of us, are walking things out that have become the pattern of our life. Listen, even parents, when you're a child, can speak things to you that never leave your mind. We've got to be careful what we speak over our children, especially if it's something mean or if it's something derogatory. Even if it's something... Listen, my sister remembers to this day... My baby sister remembers to this day how I would tell her she's really adopted. <laughs> You're not really one of us. You know that, don't you? 
Oh, yeah, you're darker than me. That's because we got you from the Indians. Mm -hmm. Oh, they, they, they still like you, but, you, you know, you're not really one of them. And she believed it. I didn't know it, but she believed it when she was a kid. It's terrible of me, wasn't it? God forgive me. So we got to be careful what we speak over our, our children and young people. We got to we got to speak blessing and life. And the prophetic, you know what the prophetic is? When somebody gives a word to somebody else, the prophetic is to build up, to encourage and edify a body or a person. And if you've got a different word like judgment or correction, you better have fear and trembling on delivering a word like that. You got to be very careful because you might be hearing from the devil instead of God. Because what is the devil? The devil is the accuser of the brethren. Okay? And so we've got to be very careful. I submit, for those of you that hear God and you feel God, because when we get the gifts of the Spirit, we get these little religious antennas up, and we want to judge everything. We want to, we want to uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We want to test and try the spirits. And we're testing and trying the people around us. And we're trying to see if they're really God and good and stuff, you know, and things. And we're, listen, God didn't call you to be a judge. You're not the self-appointed sheriff in the kingdom. You, you, you know, we just, we need to love each other and accept each other. That's a good spot to say amen right there. Need to, we need to love each other and accept each other. We need a whole lot more of that in the kingdom instead of trying everybody and testing everybody. Now, I'm not saying we don't test and try the spirits. That's just straight up word of God. So if you've got a word of correction or judgment or something like that, what I suggest you do is you go to your pastor and you sit down and say, man, this is what I think God's saying to me. And you, and you, and, and you might even get a team of people and you just begin to obey that in prayer. Don't get excited about running up and judging the whole world to hell. That shouldn't be something you're excited about. You know, pray over that thing. And then if, if, if God deems necessary and appropriate, you release it. But you don't release it like God's going to get you. You release it like if you release it, you're releasing it because that's going to change it. See, when, when, when Jonah had the word that, that God was going to bring just destruction, what happened? Was it immediate destruction? No. They heard the word, it pricked their hearts, they repented and turned. That's the reason God releases such words. When you have a dream of something terrible is going to happen, it's not foretelling you that something bad is going to happen. It's showing you if you don't pray, something bad could happen. So God has given you a weapon of intercessory, you know, warfare so that you can pray that that doesn't happen to that person or to the church. If you feel like something bad is going to, the devil is going to work against the service or the revival, you don't need to go to the pastor and say, listen, this thing is messed up. The devil's going to work and, because now you, you're stressed and you've, you've, you've shared your stress with the pastor and so he's stressed and he's working. And, you know, but what you do is you hear that and you just begin to war against it in the spirit because God just told on the devil. You see? So that's what you do with that kind of stuff in most cases. So, but God wants us to speak life. He wants us to speak blessing. He wants us to speak hope and encouragement, building people up. That's prophetic stuff. Sometimes I've been given words by God and I'll be standing in front of somebody in the altar or they'll be sitting in their seat and God will speak to me for that person. And I promise you this has happened. God has spoke a really good word in my ear about some person and I look at them and I think, really? Now I'm just flesh and blood, guys. I'm just being honest. Because sometimes we're all guilty of judging a book by its cover. That's just the way it is. We don't mean to, we don't want to. But we, and so the Lord gives me a word, a great word, a good word of what He's going to do through that person, what that person's going to be. And I think, and I look at him and I think, really? And the Lord helped me with that because I would speak certain words to people like that in churches where I didn't necessarily think it, but the rest of the church knew them because they grew up with them. They knew who their family was. And they knew the whole cycle that they were up against and what they just stayed in. And so when you speak this word of life and, and, and what God's going to do with them and God's going to use them and God loves them and you're special to the Lord, you can just feel and sense. There's people thinking, he missed that one. And then it got me. You know, and I'd have these times where I'd speak words and I, I, you know, I'd hear words and I'd think, no, that can't be God. And the Lord helped me with that. He said, I see people differently than you see people, and I see people differently than the people around them that have always known them see them. And maybe 
they've been in this cycle because it's always been seen of them and it's always been said of them that they'll never amount to anything and they'll never become anything and, and they're this because their mom was this and their dad was this and their family's always been known for this and they're, they're going to get this because their daddy had it and they're going to die of cancer they're going to die of a heart disease because it you know and people speak these words and I'm telling you it's not the same word that God wants to speak over them God just wants to see, he wants people to understand he sees them differently than the world around them sees them so you release life you release hope the word the power of the word and the things of the kingdom are voice activated here is what you must see also in Psalm 119 verse 89 it says the word is forever settled that's pretty good in heaven in heaven so if the word is forever settled in heaven here there's going to be a war for it Revelation 12 there was war going on overhead there's war so there's going to be war to see if it happens or not even you when you get a word what immediately happens when when you get a word the Bible teaches us this Jesus told the parable about seed being sown and he, he said there was, a, uh, the, there was a farmer and he's sowing seed. And here's the place that he sowed seed. And then here's another place that he sowed seed. Here's a third place he sowed seed. And then here's another place that he sowed seed. And those four fields, those four plots or pl places of, of sowing, only one of them was able to grow up and bear fruit. Because of the other three, something was warring against the seed against the word and the seed Jesus explained the seed they said what does this mean and he says oh the seed is the word of God and he said so when the seed goes forth what happens demon birds come down to try and steal it away from you the cares of life will try to choke it away from you the sun will try to dry it out there's going to be all kinds of elements and things to steal from you the word that God wants to speak over you and into you that's why we must war for the word in earth over our head, there's war for the Word. But in heaven, the Word is settled. God didn't make a mistake. It's just so. If God says it, it's just so. But between heaven, where the throne is and where we're at, the enemy will try to stop it. The enemy will try to slow it down. And he will work on us on the earth level to try to get us to mess up in the flesh and, and things like that. Listen, we could talk about Esau. Why did God hate Esau? I don't know. It's another message. But anyway, here's the thing. Esau was willing to trade the word of his life or the promise of his life or the, uh, you know, the blessing of his life for something less. He traded it for a temporary fleshly need. He wanted a bowl of stew. You know? Okay, I'll give you my blessing. Just give me some soup. You know, and if we're not careful, things in the flesh on the wor in the world will get us to shortchange the word that is over our life. Is this making sense, anybody? And so the thing is, if the word is forever settled in heaven, what we've got to do is get the word to the place where it's accomplished. And I think the easiest way for that to heaven or to happen is for heaven to be right here. This is this is where we're getting to the thing. Can we experience that? Yes. Now, I've talked in some of the other services about us getting in the Spirit, about John and the door and the heaven and being called up and Paul being called up to the third heaven. It's one thing for us to get to heaven, but it's another thing for heaven to come to us. It can happen, and there are spiritual or scriptural examples of it happening. There are quite a few. I'm not going to go to all of them. I'm not even going to go to many of them. I'm not even going to go. I'll, I'll make mention of two or three. Upper room. The Holy Spirit came down. Heaven came down. And the first thing that was filled with the Spirit in Acts chapter 2 was the room. So we call our churches, oftentimes we call our churches Spirit-filled churches. I pray to God that we really would have Spirit-filled churches. And we need to begin to pray for that and believe for that. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, a place. We need to have a burden and a concern for our place. But first and foremost, before we get to thinking about the city, we've got to think about what's in here. We need God in here. We don't need just pictures of heavenly things, doves and crosses and stuff. We need God to really be here so that when people walk in, they feel something. When they sit in that seat, they're convicted. They're not comfortable. They're convicted. They feel the draw and the call and the tug of the love of God at their heart. And that happens when God is in the room. 
So we need to, listen, Jacob laid down to sleep. Jacob laid down to sleep and he had this dream and there was a ladder and there were angels ascending and descending. At the top was the Lord. And when he woke up, what did he say? When he woke up, he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't even know it. There was something special about the place. He called it Bethel, the gate of heaven, the house of God. He recognized something holy about the place. And I believe God is wanting to find places. He put it in David's heart to build a place. David couldn't build the temple like he wanted to, so he just laid up the the supplies. But in the meantime, David did build and erect a spiritual place. And that was the tabernacle or the tent of David. Interesting to note, later in the Old Testament, just before you get into the New Testament, there is this prophecy that says God is going going to restore the fallen tent of David. Now why? Why doesn't God want to restore the beautiful temple that Herod built? Why doesn't God want to restore the beautiful, the unmatchable temple that Solomon built? Of all of the things they built, all the architecture, you know, in those times, God said, I'm going to restore the fallen tent of David. And that's what it was. It was an open tent. But what David did with that open air tent, by the way, open air tent with the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God was really against the law. It was like breaking one of them rules where God says, you come this far, but the heart of man just goes a little bit further, chases hard after God. That's what God wants. God sometimes tests us and says, you just stop right here that's good you're doing good this is how far you can come but when you go hard and follow after God and say God I don't want to stop Elijah and Elisha you see that played out Elijah you know he came to Elisha and Elisha started following Elijah and there got to a point where Elijah said to him thank you you've done good now I'm going to go on you know God bless you. And he went and Elisha says, no, 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 I'm coming too. You're going, I'm coming. And so then a second time, Elijah said to Elisha, okay, wonderful. I'm so thankful for you. This is great. This is a good place to say goodbye. And I thank you and appreciate Bye. And he he leaves. And Elisha came again and says, no, if you're going to keep going, I'm going to keep going. We've got to have that heart with God that we don't stop, but we keep going hard after God. Okay? And so the Lord The Lord wants us to do that. He wants us to experience that. And David understood that. So he built this open air tent and the Ark of the Covenant was there. And the, and the priest would dance around the Ark of the Covenant. And 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day, there was worship and intercession going on that lasted 33 years. And it never stopped. You know what he did? He built a place for the presence of God. The whole backstory of that is this. David said, we got to get God. The first thing of his kingdom, the first thing that he did publicly was say hey we got to get the presence of God here this is the city of God and it can't be the city of God if God's not in the city let's go get the ark and they and that's a whole story there but they went and they got the ark when they brought it correctly David led the procession of the whole kingdom and he danced the whole way back for miles getting back to Jerusalem danced the Bible says with all of his might holding nothing back his own wife was embarrassed by the undignified worship and David said to her, hey honey, if you think this is something, you ain't seen nothing yet. He said, I will be even more undignified. He worshipped and he preached and he taught that we should worship God and dance before the Lord with all of our heart. He trained and he taught uh, musicians how to not just how to play their instruments but how to flow in the anointing how to prophesy on their instruments he taught them and trained them to do this it was important to him that there'd be a flow of the spirit what he did was he built a place for God I'm telling you just like the movie field of dreams if we build it he will come come on give God praise if we 
If we put our effort in obediently preparing a place for God, He will come. He's looking for a place to, to lay His head. I believe the head of God could rest right here. We can sanctify this room, walk around this room, anoint everything in here with oil, and say, God, we want this to be a sanctified place. We want this to be a holy place. We want this to be a place of faith. We want this to be a place of miracles and healing. We want this to be a place where you can do, and I'm telling you, God will come. And I know a lot of that's already happened. And that's why you feel the Lord here. Can I have an amen? So what I feel like is God is going to give us moments and times where we will know we're in the presence of heaven. In those times, I'm going to give you a tip. 2013 will be a wonderful, good, great year for you if you learn this. If you learn this, you can form your world, just like God formed the world when God spoke. He spoke to the nothingness and the creativity of God was released. And everything changed when God spoke. You will change your world when you tap into the anointing and speak to it. Did y'all get that? When you sense the anointing, you can change your world, your family, your finances, your situation, your job, everything. It doesn't matter if it's at a place and state of nothingness. When you get into the flow of the anointing, speak to it. In the anointing. Because the word is forever settled in heaven. So when the stuff of heaven begins to settle on you and around you and you get in that atmosphere and that spirit, start talking. Start speaking. Start declaring a thing. Start saying things of faith. Even, even if you don't believe it when you begin, just start saying, I'm going to overcome. I'm going to rise again in the name of Jesus. Start saying stuff. Speak the word. God is for me. If God is for me, who can be against me? I'm going through. I'm going in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And just begin to speak these things. God says I'm healed. God says I'm blessed. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's Jehovah Roth. God, And begin to speak these things. And as you speak these things, the word will work. And I'm telling you, 2013 for the year, of the kingdom in the kingdom of God stuff will be voice activated and God will give you moments in the glory and moments of heaven coming down on you over you and around you and when you get in those moments the Lord says speak his word the word will work why do you think the word is called a hammer because it's a tool it'll work for you why do you think it's a sword because it will fight for you you take the word and you fight and there might be obstacles there usually is and there might be things that you don't know how they're going to fix and how they're going to break but I'm telling you what the word can break through so speak the word have confidence in the word get in the glory get in the heaven and when you get in the heaven you begin to speak the word and when you speak the word I'm telling you look out devils will run but God will move come on give God praise right now if you would stand to your feet with me I gotta start closing here hallelujah 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 Mm -hmm. Releasing the word of God in the atmosphere of heaven. Releasing. There was a brother when we moved to, shortly after my wife and I got married, we moved to Columbus, Ohio. We were attending church at Columbus in uh, World Harvest Church. And, and it was just a great year, you know, for us when we first got married, just to get away from everything and everybody and just kind of get to really connect and and uh, be in the presence of God where the Lord was moving there and stuff and so while we were there this this man had become part of the church and had moved his family there he was a businessman and he had moved from some other state he had it upon his heart to to be there where God was doing something he just felt a connection I got to get there and he was there and he was a businessman and this is what the Lord laid on his heart, and he said he felt like God taught him. This whole thing about sowing a seed, for him personally, the Lord spoke to him that every time in a service where he's seen the anointing get really rise and get strong, here's what he would do. Not because he's trying to get money out of God. God's not a, you know, a, a money machine. But he was so sensitive to it and so appreciative of it that he would honor God and say every time God the anointing was really strong and stirring in the service, he would put great increase on whatever it was he was given in the offering. He would sow 
great seeds in the anointing, in the time of the anointing. And can I say to you, he got to share his testimony in just a few months' time, this young businessman became a millionaire. God started blessing his business. And it was all because he wasn't telling anybody. It wasn't something braggadocious. He was just saying, wow, God is moving. Oh, I love you, God. And one of the ways he would worship God is he would sow a seed and he recognized God's in the house. I'm honoring God. I'm worshiping God. And he would, he would, he would really put down seed. I'm telling you the same for you. As we see in 2013, when you see the anointing, it don't matter if you're sitting in your seat, if you're standing in the back, it doesn't matter if you're at home or in your car. Whenever you begin to see and feel and sense that stirring of the anointing, start talking. Start talking over your family. Start talking over your body, your health. Start talking over your finances. I'm telling you, the anointing is going to be on the word that you're willing to speak. Things of the kingdom are voice activated and will break through. Revelation 12 is a, is, is a chapter of spiritual warfare. We'll win as we come in agreement with the blood of the Lamb. Jesus has already won. But for it to be activated or realized for us, we've got to speak it forth. So as you see the stirring of the anointing, as heaven begins to come down, speak, talk. Talk to yourself. Talk to your situation. Start fussing at your mountains and tell them how small they are compared to God. You know, start go out and listen. I heard stories years ago by, by Paula White how that when they were, you know, young in the ministry, they had nothing. And she one day she said the Lord just stirred and, and the Holy Spirit got in her heart and she went into her kitchen and opened her empty cabinets and opened her empty refrigerator and opened her empty freezer and started talking to them and say, you be filled in the name of Jesus. And I declare that God is for me and God's blessing me and He's, 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 the, he's the Lord that is my source. And, and I trust in God and you be filled and you be filled and you be filled and you be filled. And she said she began to see as God would bring it in. I'm telling you, Speak. Speak the word. Speak the prophetic word. Ah, shake. Something's in the room right now. Come on, just raise your hand. Something's in the hole of a heart of a head. Yeah, you can speak over your church. You can speak over your youth group. You can you can speak over the worship. You can speak over things. Speak over things. You speak life and you speak blessing. You're speaking the will of God. I want every head bowed, every eye closed, every mind on God. Christians praying. I want you to pray, pray for, pray for the freedom of the word to go forth right now. What I need to share, what's uh, about to happen, is the most important thing happening in the city, in the county, and maybe the state. I want to give an invitation. I want to ask you right now, and I, I know I've preached for several minutes, but I want to ask you right now, just because of the importance of what we're doing right here, it won't be too extreme lengthy. But I want to ask you if you would just be respectful in this moment because this is such a special, holy moment to please don't be moving around. If you can hold it for just a second, don't go to the restroom or the water fountain or go out to take a phone call or anything. Just, just give us just a few more minutes. Be very be reverential of this, this time right now. No talking or laughing if you can help it. The Lord's dealing with every heart in this room right now. I ask for the power of God to touch every person. I pray right now for every mind that God would conquer every mind and every argument and every doubt, every unbelief. I pray for every bondage to be broke. I pray for everything that you might have come in here with to be checked at the door. You're free in this moment. You're free in this moment to choose, to decide, to receive, to accept. Now because you're free and because it's a choice, you can also pick it up when you leave. You can take that same junk home with you. But you don't have to. Right now, the anointing is here in this room. God is here today. And He is here. Listen, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. Matter of fact, nobody has ever come to God perfect. He's not expecting that. He's not looking for that. Come as you are. He is the only person that means that. Come as you are. He loves you just like you are. Now, I do believe He loves you too much to leave you that way. He'll help you get better. He'll help you become the person you want to be. But that will be in His love. And that will be as, as He leads you. I'm not, I'm not selling a, a book of rules and I'm not you know, putting anything on you. I'm giving you an invitation to love and life and freedom right now. 
As every head's bowed, every eye's closed, every mind's on God, and people are praying, people are interceding, people are standing in the gap. You might feel led right now as you're praying to pray for the person beside you, in front of you, behind you, or somebody else in the room that's on your heart. You do that. You do that, please. God needs people. Listen, there's spiritual warfare that always happens whenever souls are being weighed in the balance. I don't know how many more opportunities you will have to be face-to-face confronted with the love of Jesus Christ, the gospel, where he just stands and knocks. It's like he knocks at your heart's door. And you can, you can ignore it, and you can put it off, and you can say later, and you can say, I'm a good person, and I got it all worked out. But the fact of the matter is, he's knocking at your door. And if you don't respond, listen, and I'm not asking you to do something in, you know, incredibly weird. I will give you an invitation in just a second to get out from where you're standing and come down to this front. I want to give you that opportunity to make a public profession. As hard as that is, it seems so hard for us. I don't know why. Other than it's a spiritual thing, it's like demons weigh on your hands. When I ask in a second, if you just raise your hand, if that's you. When I ask, there's going to be like demons holding your arms down and giving you reasons and excuses why it's not you and why you don't have to do it. And when it comes time to come to the front, it's like all hell will try to keep you there in that spot. And every thought and excuse and reason will come for you to stay right there and why you don't have to go and why you don't need to go. But I'm telling you, you can break those things off and in Jesus' name and you can be redeemed and you can be saved and you can be free. That's the truth. I don't know what lie you've bought into, but the truth is you can be free. You're a winner. You're not a loser. So now, as every head's bowed, every eye's closed, every, every mind on God and people praying all over the room. Every one of us are needy, and I know that. I want to speak to you today. If, if you understand the gospel is this, that Jesus is good, and He came, and He, he lived, and He died, and, you know, and they buried Him. You believe that? You, you believe that He did it for you. But you also know that He didn't stay dead, that He rose again. And He's right now seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible tells us that He's making intercession for you. He's praying for you. He paid the price so you wouldn't have to pay it. Now He went all the way, climbing up the, the, the mountainside with the cross on his, his bloody beaten back. He went all the way and He paid the full complete price. You know, nails driven through His hands and His feet. And, the, you know, the, the crown of thorns beat down into His skull. All the, the beating, you know, all of this public humiliation, he did it all the way. So when I'm asking you just to step out from that padded pew and, and, and take a few steps on, on nice carpet in a very loving atmosphere, it's not too much. It's not too much. Jesus loved you more than you can ever understand. So right now I'm speaking directly to your heart, and I believe God is. If you were to die today, what happens? You go up, you go down, you just don't know. If the Lord were to return, listen, we're living in the last days. I, I believe that. You see things happening. You see, uh, you see terrible, crazy things, an acceleration of major events. There's, an, there's like the world is coming to a boiling point of major events. They're not so scattered anymore. They're happening all the time. Hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and acts of violence and terrorism and wars and, and new diseases and just it's it's crazy insane the boiling point that this world is coming to. So we know that we're in the last days and we know that Jesus made this promise. He's coming back. If he returns today, there's that trumpet sound. Those that are ready, out of here. Hallelujah. But if that trumpet would sound right now in this moment, would you be ready? Or would you still be standing here looking around at who's left and who's gone? I want to ask if that's you and you just realize and you just know whether you've never made this decision or you made it before and you just, you have seriously and you know that you've drifted away from God. You just don't feel comfortable with where you're at. You just need to know that you're saved. If that's you today and you need to know that you're saved, I want you to stick your hand up right now. Do it now. All over the room. Just raise your hand. I see that hand. Who else? Come on. I see that hand. 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 Who else? Raise your hand. I need to know that I'm saved. I see that hand. I see that hand. 
Okay, there might be others. There might be others that you're just getting ready to and you want to. What I'm going to do right now, those of you that raised your hand, and if you should have raised your hand and you wanted to, I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, don't look around and see who else goes. You just go. You just act on it. When I get to three, you come and you come quickly. Don't give yourself time to talk out of it. Don't allow the devil to talk. You just come. Don't worry about people thinking about it. You just come. This is more important than any other thing. When I get to three, you just come. One, Come on, this is it. This is it. This is big stuff. This is important. This is your moment. This is your God moment. Two, I'm counting straight through. You ready? One, two, three. Come on, come on, come on, come on. God bless you. God bless you. Come on now. Come on now. Come on. God bless you. Just come and if you would, just come and maybe kneel in this front. I've not brought up prayer warriors or anything like that for you guys, so I'm just going to lead you in a prayer myself. If you're already praying and, and, and things, that's good. That's great. You continue to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to lead you in this prayer right now. This prayer doesn't save you. It's just you coming to God and fully believing on Him. That's what saves you. You turning. You turning from your yesterday and all your wrongdoings. You turning to God. You're saying, God, this is horrible. This is horrible. This is terrible, this person that I am and that I've become. And you needing and accepting His grace and His blood, knowing that's what saves you and His grace. Well, listen, right now I'm going to lead you in this prayer, and I want you to pray after me because it just gives us something to focus on and put words to. So right now, can we pray? Everybody that wants to join in this prayer, pray. I'll pray, you pray after me. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Maybe all over again. Help me pray, guys. Forgive me of my sins, my failures and shortcomings. Wash me clean. Make me new. I trust in you. You are holy, righteous, You are the king of the universe. You're the prince of peace. There's nobody like you. And today I look to you. And I receive you. I believe on you. Your word says that you'd forgive me. I accept that. And this day, I know you've saved me. Amen. Can we give God a great big praise all over the room? Come on, angels in heaven are rejoicing. Let's give God some real praise. Come on, we can do even better than that. Let's let's give God some real praise. This is what it's all about. Hallelujah.